Hello everyone, I greet in the name of God Almighty. My name is Apostle Newton Silas and today we have a very interesting video to react to and this one was done by Charles Lee Eaton and then he was talking about the spread of Islam live and also works. I believe that this is going to be a very interesting video so I want to encourage you to watch from the beginning to the end so that we can also learn about this concept of um, Islam from this um, British um, diplomat. He's also a writer. So that's why I'm saying that just watch from the beginning to the end to hear some of the inciting things you'll be sharing at the course of this video. So if today happens to be the first time of you checking out my channel, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and follow me on my Facebook and Instagram. And if you have any video you want me to react to, don't forget to drop it at the comment section and I'm going to check it out. So guys, before we get on to the video, I'm a theologian and I make this video not to discredit anyone's religion this is basically for educational purposes and i believe that at the end of this video we all are going to learn from this so let's get down to this video and check this out matters of faith hello and welcome to matters of faith i'm christiana Bakker, and today we are in london in fact in wimbledon you know mm. where the great tennis game takes place once a year and we're here in the home of a very special british english gentleman he is a trained actor um, a very well-traveled former diplomat for the foreign service the british foreign service he's also an award-winning writer and a Muslim on a spiritual path for over 50 years. Welcome to Matters of Faith, Mr. Gaeton. Hello, Christiana. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us here in your home. It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> How are you feeling? Um, old. <laughs> the <laughs> oh. Only straight answer to that. <laughs> no one would ever know. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us how did it all start? Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about your life before we talk about Sufism, our yes, subject indeed. today. Yes. I think probably um, the decisive factor in my life was my very peculiar childhood. My parents were elderly. My father was 67 when I was born, which is unusual. Yes. And they had no young friends and therefore no friends of children. And at the same time, I think my mother was determined that I should not be brainwashed, turned into a conventional English creature or whatever. Okay. Um, her great determination was that I should mm. be an individual thinking for himself. Yeah. Well, of course, the result was that until I was nine, I met no other children. Mm. And that, let's face it, is a very, very peculiar situation. Mm. And I've always said that um, in the vicissitudes of life and the odd changes and so on, there are usually advantages and disadvantages and I can see both in my childhood. Um, it didn't prepare me for dealing with the normal world, dealing with people. I never learned to be competitive because obviously if you're not with other children you can't compete. Okay. Um, to such an extent that when I first did go to school and these boys are playing football I thought it very strange because it must be bad manners. The boy with the ball at his feet didn't give it up to the other boy who wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> and equally, and a bigger problem for me, of course, I was with adults the whole time, my mother and my aunts. And a child cannot argue successfully with grown-ups. It's a losing battle. And I learned never to argue. Now, that has been awkward in a way. Okay. It's meant that very often, if people I'm with say things that I thoroughly disagree with, that maybe I even disapprove of, I don't say anything. Of course, I can't involve myself in a normal argument. I'm sure that quality must have helped you as a diplomat later on. 
It yeah. probably did. It probably did. <laughs> <laughs> but I said advantages and disadvantages. Um, the discovery when I was finally, finally with other children, other people, mm. it seemed almost miraculous that I could have friends. Okay. And from then on, really, every human encounter has been important and even seemed significant. Even sometimes, you know, casual conversation in an airport lounge or something, I remembered it as another human contact. Mm. Of course, if you had virtually no human contacts when you were a child, then mm. you value them. So, as I said, um, advantages and disadvantages. But it also meant that um, there was no imprint on my mind and my soul of modern attitudes, modern ideas and so on. My mother was determined that nobody should talk about religion to me. Okay. Not actually but why? But she had a great fear of having religion thrust down my throat. So I was um, almost a blank sheet on which you might have written anything according to circumstances. And you went to a great university, you had a great education, uh, very privileged. Um, yes, I was very lucky. I went to a major public school, Charterhouse, which oddly enough, after that odd childhood, I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed it partly because um, I made a place for myself as the sort of schoolboy agony aunt. <laughs> um, I was always a good listener. And other boys would come and tell me about their worries and their fears and their passions, as they were called, and they had passions for one another. And I listened patiently and was fascinated. So from there I went on to Cambridge. And that really, this seems strange, that was of no great significance because the war started almost the day that I went up to Cambridge. Oh, okay. And obviously that was the dominant factor in our lives. And at that time the system was that we could go through the Tribal's course in two years instead of three. And then we'd be called up. Um, soon after me, after my time, they decided that this was probably a mistake. And after that, people who returned alive from the war uh, got a free, free um, course at university. But as far as I was concerned, um, my time there was simply dominated by the fact that um, in two years' time, and then one year's time, and then a few months' time, I was going to be in the army. And from what I knew of war, from stories which I was brought up of First World War, that meant I would die. Mm. It was simple as that. So um, you can't really concentrate on very dull studies if you believe that you're going to be dead in a year or so. Mm, yes. It seems a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> so you had some fun instead, or something like that. <laughs> I had, I had other, other interests, basically. Yeah. You've been on a Sufi path, on a spiritual path, for mm. over 50 years, for a very long time. What is the significance of this now, where you are at now? Um, how important is spirituality for you now, and this mm. long path you've been on? Spirituality. Oh, um, without that I would probably um, slit my throat. <laughs> I mean, there'd be no particular point in in living. No, it's that important. Um, and uh, it's almost unimaginable to lose that sense of the Divine Presence once you've tasted it. But I don't want to exaggerate that or make claims for myself. Um, that Presence can be tasted at so many different degrees, in so many different ways. And all are worthwhile. Because what matters is 
an awareness of reality. Because remember in Sufism particularly, we like very often to refer to God as the real, the real. The only thing that is real, though he's not a thing. The only reality, ultimately. Everything else derives from that reality, takes its existence, mm. its apparent um, existence from that reality, and eventually returns to it. And in your book, your new book, which is just out, um, mm. A Bad Beginning, you write a special passage about um, old age and spirituality, and the importance of spirituality, especially in old age, as in your late 80s. <laughs> um, can you share this, uh, you know, this special insight that, that you have with us? I please? don't know that I had any special insight. Um, the point about someone of my age is that you are very close to death and very aware of death and one hopes well prepared for it. Now in theory, um, every Muslim should, in the saying of the Prophet, um, <coughs> live today as though he was going to live forever and at the same time to live today as though he would die tomorrow. Yeah. But um, although so many people, particularly in time of war, die young, the fact remains that most people, until they approach old age, don't have any intense awareness of what is coming. I suppose my generation, in a sense, rather different because of the war. Would you say that uh, the spiritual life um, is a preparation for... Oh yes, yes. ...the meeting with God? Yes, indeed. And you need to be prepared for that. Mm. Um, this is so nice. To have that meeting, if you're totally unprepared, would be perhaps some, um, I don't know. So what's the best preparation? Oh, um, according to, again to say the Prophet, um, the constant remembrance of God, which we call dhikr, and the constant awareness of death. Let's, um, could you tell us a little bit about your autobiography mm. that um, yeah, you've just written and we've got the cover here because the, the books are still with the printers at this moment in time. But um, <laughs> what, um, you know, what is that about and why did you write it, in fact? I wrote it because um, at the age of 12, I thought I had discovered the meaning of life, life mm -hmm. and the purpose of life. Because my grandfather, who had had every imaginable adventure, um, wrote 60 books. And I thought, well, this makes sense. What, ha what happens is you live a life and you write about it. There's no point in living if you don't write about it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So that from the time I was 16 or so, I had this, um, this desire to write an autobiography. And I waited um, 70 years before <laughs> <laughs> doing so. But um, what I've done with that, you see, I kept a diary, personal diary, from the age of 12 on. So I tried a technique which some people seem to think has worked quite well. Um, juxtaposing quotes from the diary and narrative as understood now by me. And sometimes they completely contradict each other. Um, as indeed diary entries do often contradict memories. Um, I was convinced that particular meeting with a young girl in Jamaica that we four fell passionately in love on the spot that first evening. Mm. Reading my diary, we obviously didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was some time before that happened. 
But um, so if the diary lies behind your autobiography, you can't really depart very far from the truth. But um, because I wanted it to be objective, the main story ends in 1930, uh, 1959, when I was um, 38. And um, because that, well, that was the story of the bad beginning, so to speak. Your after glamorous that, life as a diplomat, yeah, giving, hosting parties. After that, things opened up, you see. Yes. And a happy marriage. So, but um, so it's written in the third person. Always gay this, gay that, gay the other thing, not I. Made it much easier to to write. Yes, I'd have been embarrassed writing some of the things that I did. Whereas I'm saying he did this, he did that. Much easier. Exactly. On this happy note, we shall take a small break, and we'll be back <laughs> with matters of faith in a few oh. moments where we'll be discussing the nature of God in Islam as um, in comparison with Christianity and also talk a little bit more about Sufism and what we all lack in life as Muslims. See you there. Whoa, that's a very interesting uh, video listening to Charles Eaton, that's former British um, diplomat and also an author sharing matters about um, life, sharing about his 50 year, you understand, in Islam. And of course, he wrote uh, so many books and one of them was The Bad Beginning as a part to Islam. I believe that uh, some of us have learned a lot, you understand, from some of the things, you understand, he was saying. Uh, one thing that he pointed out that kind of struck my mind was when he was talking about God and how prepared in a stand will you be and then sharing his experience and saying that as for his age that's why he wrote the book uh, Bad Beginning as a part to Islam. It means that he tried to share about some of the things, you understand, he does, he traveled, he do this, become a diplomat, and also his experience in the times of the World War II. And then after that, after everything, before he was able to discover what Islam, and he was trying to share his experience. And that's when he was talking about the life of Prophet um, Muhammad, may peace be upon him, talking about living as if you're gonna live forever and living today as if you are going to die tomorrow. Talking about us in a sense, how prepared in a sense we should be before we go in to meet our maker. Since it's something that you can't be able to like tell what is gonna to happen to you in the future or even after that very um moment. And then how prepared in a sense are you, which means it's about what you did how you able to like share love you understand with one another and then he make us to understand that he was able to discover real love when he found um islam i think it's very interesting um video and then when you listen to some of the key things you understand he's kind of talking about you understand in this interview is they are very serious things that you know we need to take it in a sense seriously and then if we able to like apply this kind of things you understand in our life it will truly you understand help us you understand as humans and then also as individual and just as how i have always encouraged each and every one of you in my videos i always says that we are just here on a temporal basis it means that we need not to get engulfed by whatever that is happening here on this very earth. Whatever you do, know fully well that the same way you came, you are going to return with nothing. Which means that you need not to accumulate whatever that you know that you will not even need it, right? So whatever you have, try to to share the love. You need to not understand to accumulate all the wealth, forgetting the fact that with the cars, the money, the properties you're going to own, you're not going to carry anything, you understand, while you are returning back to your maker. It will just be only you. And that is just it. And then some of the deeds you leave on this very earth is what you're going to give account about. 
and then from there god's going to decide in a sense by what you do with of course we are very aware that of course it's a merciful god he can show mercy in a sense but it's been expected of us you understand to do what he has asked us to do through what his books he has given us you understand the bible that's for the christians and then to the muslim of course he have given the quran all those ones are there would ask guidance they are there to tell us in a sense what to do and what not to do and all these things is to be able to prepare us while we are living here on this very earth before we die and then we go to meet him and then that's when we're going to face judgment and depending on whatever you and me do will determine in a sense to whether we are making it to the paradise or eternal hellfire it's just in a sense up to us that's why i say that when you go to heaven it's up to you when you go to hell it's still up to you you just have to make this very decision a very interesting video and i believe that we must have learned a lot in a sense from this video of course we'll be taking out in a sense part two of this same um interview so that we can be able to like learn a lot in a sense about um islam so guys this is the end of my video if you like my reaction you should like share and subscribe and if you have any video you want me to react to don't forget to drop it at the comment section and i'm going to check it out so guys you remain blessed and i see you in my next video bye bye